This is the Library Podcast. I'm Troy. I'm Tish. And we are continuing our conversation about Isaac Asimov's book, iRobot, which is our upcoming one book, one college text. We are very happy to be joined today by two psychology faculty members. I'm Amy Williamson. My name is Laura Lawson Collins. And thank you both for being here. So we wanted to start off the conversation today uh, looking at one of the themes in iRobot, which is really how we interact with AI. So both what do we bring to our interactions with AI and how AI might impact the way we interact with each other? Well, there's some mixed research on this. Um, There is some research that focuses on some of the negative outcomes of interacting with AI and with technology. And then there's also been some more recent research focusing on some of the positive um, qualities or outcomes of these kinds of interactions. So to just briefly, you know, talk about each, some of the negative things that researchers have noted is that it does tend to decrease the quality and quantity of face-to-face interactions. So, you know, interactions that you might talk about in the real world, uh, we tend to have fewer of them the more we use technology. um, And there is some evidence to suggest that the quality of those interactions tends to go down as well. So uh, people have a harder time reading other people's emotions, picking up on social cues, uh, the more and more they're engaged with technology. And that would be, you know, some of the negative outcomes and consequences. Um, But there, there has been also some pushback on that, especially more recently, looking at younger people. Um, As Troy mentioned to me in a conversation a while ago about uh, Socrates and, you know, always being concerned about new technologies and Socrates being concerned about reading and writing being um, a technology that's going to ruin the next generation. Um, You know, we've had this concern forever. Um, And so some of the more recent research looking at uh, teenagers in particular suggests that uh, teens are really using technology as their social connection. So although it may be decreasing their face-to-face interactions, they are feeling supported, they are feeling connected through technology, and that this is the way that they are connecting with their peers. And that although that avenue has changed, the way that they're connecting has changed, they're still spending just as much time connecting with others. It's just in a different way. Just kind of building on that a little bit. Um, I think the artificial intelligence has changed the way that we relate to each other um, in a number of ways. We rely on technology to tell us who to date. Um, some There are some technologies out there to tell you who to marry or what to name your child. Um, most of us have used Google Maps or Waze or something that tells us where to go. <clears throat> In spite of us thinking we might know a better way to go there, we follow what the computer tells us to do. Um, So we definitely defer to technology in a lot of ways that um, has changed quite a bit versus the way um, maybe a generation ago. I think what we have seen a little bit from a psychological perspective viewpoint is um, an increase in in some uh, anxiety and depression uh, in the... Generation Z, and part of it they attribute to technology that they are at a, a deficit when it comes to reading emotional cues. Uh, they're a little more uncomfortable uh, interacting with other people. They'd rather uh, use technology to make their appointments and to order food and do these things where we used to um, have you know one-on-one kind of human connection. So I think it's changing us in terms of the way we relate to each other. Um, it, you know, it's kind of the jury's out on whether that's going to be good or bad, but I think some evidence is pointing to us really needing to be careful with the way we begin raising children when they're immersed in technology and using it to meet their needs, uh, you know, asking Alexa questions and, um, you know, how does that then impact the way that they relate to other children and, uh, other pe- other people in the world, and that that'll be an ongoing question we'll have to deal with. I think. Mm-hmm. So let me ask from like a developmental psychology perspective: um, 
how should we understand the difference between the ways that kids might interact with technology versus the ways adults may interact with technology or maybe the impact on kids versus adults? Well, I think that there is a very significant difference between kids and adults and their interactions with technology. I think that there is a decent amount of evidence to suggest that there are some advantages for adults who interact with, um, for example, gaming. There is an entire TED Talk on um, the advantages that an adult gets from from putting some hours in uh, at gaming, you know, uh, increased ability to uh, pick out targets and um, hone in on on certain things in a visual image and faster response time and that type of thing. But all of that's been done with adults whose brains, while still changeable, are not as malleable as children. Mm -hmm. And I think the jury is still somewhat out on kids. I, I think that we need to be a lot more cautious when it comes to children and technology. Um, I think that their brains are developing at such a rapid pace. They are so malleable by the environment that they're placed in. We don't know what the long-term consequences are going to be for a brain that grows up on this kind of intense input. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe that input is preparing them for a job that they're going to need that kind of uh, intensity. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also setting them up for uh, difficulty in other situations like face-to-face, uh, -face interpersonal interaction, um, or a re romantic relationship, um, or learning in a classroom with just one professor speaking at a time, that, that those all might be more difficult things for their brain to be able to do because it's been wired up on something that's um, giving them so much stimulation. Mm -hmm. I would agree um, with what you were saying, all, everything you said. I think for adults, there's definitely a, depending on the adult, because there are some adults um, there's some research showing, you know, we haven't built in negativity bias. That's just how our brains work. And so for people who have more of a uh, slant towards depression or other things like that, um, some uh, too much technology can actually cause problems. Um, and I would think that would transfer to children as well. Um, some of the information I've read about children and technology shows, you know, it seems to be that a lot of times you're getting this dopamine, you're getting this reward experience. And so, um, you know, how does that translate into a world that's much slower, much less colorful, <laughs> much different than what is uh, online? And I don't think we, we know for sure what that's going to, what that's going to look like. But um, we do know that I, that it's, that it encourages that relationship with technology. Um, just to pull an example from the uh, book, you know, the little girl has this relationship with the robot that is very human-like, that he's her best friend and he's her confidant and he is her, uh, you know, nanny, for lack of a better word, where the mother of this child uh, sees him as a, you know, bucket of uh, bolt nuts and bolts, so to speak. And so I think that the younger children, you know, the kids right now are growing up with that same level of um, attachment to their technology. And I don't think we know in the end how that's going to play. We can speculate. There's been some people who speculated that, you know, in the next 10 years, we're going to have um, some people who are going to have a lot of difficulty with social relationships, and maybe that'll give people in our field <laughs> a lot of a lot of opportunities. But uh, you know, there's so much that we don't know yet about it. So um, I have uh, kids right now. Not to overshare on a podcast, but um, one thing that I found really interesting with them and their friends is how social their gaming is right and even when they're on their own they're they're playing the same games as their friends and when they get back together they're sharing ideas and so i mean i don't know what the the outcome is going to be and if my kids are representative of anything mm -hmm. um 
But I also think that when I hear things about, you know, like how kids are isolated because they're playing on iPads or whatever, mm-hmm. I mean, that's not what I see. I mean, I see them really sharing ideas and exploring and, and discovering together. Um, so it, I think it's, it is, it's, a, it's complicated. Yeah, I agree. And I think what Amy said earlier, too, about it impacting different people and different personalities right. in different ways is, is a really valid point and one that's important to remember. Um, when you look at the research uh, and in teenagers, most of them say that social media is really positive for them. It gives them lots of support. It gives them the connection to their peers. They don't know what they do without it. <laughs> um, you know, they wouldn't have that same connection. There's still a minority of teenagers who say, well, actually, social media is negative for me. It makes me feel right. bad about myself. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm missing out or I feel like I'm not good enough. Um, and I, I think that some people, some kids could use technology to isolate mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that it seems that the average child um, is using it right now for connection, mm-hmm. um, a good deal of it for connection, but they're connecting in different ways. I think the thing that we need to worry about is, you know, the rapidity of movement, the the color change, the, the amount of stimulation that's coming into the brain and how that is wiring the brain up, um, I think is going to potentially make it difficult to interact in an everyday kind of environment. That that would be, you know, I think where a lot of the concern is of pediatricians and um, and scientists right now that you know, the brains are getting wired up for a world that is um, not appropriate to everyday life, Mm -hmm. but it is appropriate to technology. And so, you know, I guess that's a question. As a parent, you know, do you want their their brain to be wired up for uh, what's appropriate for their generation and potentially for a job? Mm -hmm. Um, Or do you want it to be wired up to have healthy face-to-face interactions in more real life environments. And how can you balance? Right? Yeah. How do you balance yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so one of the other uh, issues that the book brings up and we're interested to talk to you about is this idea of consciousness and um, how we might know if AI becomes conscious. It's this thing that is like the stuff of science fiction right now, but I think a concern like, um, would we know? Are there are there markers, uh, especially from a psychological perspective, that would help us understand whether or not AI becomes conscious? I, I think, um, you know, that, like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, there's been some pretty big warnings about that happening and how are we going to prevent the robots from taking over and so on. Um, and I don't think we really have a good litmus test for what constitutes consciousness in AI. I mean, we've got the Turing test, we've got some other ideas. However, you know, we're still looking at consciousness from the perspective of biological carbon-based life. So is a rock conscious, you know, is an animal, is an ant conscious, you know, how do we decide those things? We, We have some pretty safe criteria, I think, for humans. Although, Um, there's even some gray area for humans when we look at consciousness, what constitutes consciousness. Um, One researcher who works with individuals in comas and really has found that there's actually levels within that. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we know if people are aware? So it seems to be this awareness of self that's a piece of it. Um, How will we know that? With artificial intelligence, it's hard hard to say we seem to be based on what i've read you know probably at least 100 years away from that so probably not in our lifetimes would we see something like that so maybe we have a long time to define what that means um yeah i think that this is a tremendously difficult question to answer um and I think that it's a question that philosophers have struggled with and, and scientists from all different fields have struggled with. And I, I think that just consciousness itself is something that many neuroscientists still struggle to define mm-hmm. definitively. Um, I, I completely agree self-awareness is a part of it, but it's very difficult to know when something is self-aware. You could program a computer uh, or, or program um, 
AI to interact as though it were self-aware. That doesn't mean that it is self-aware. There's no solid test that we have right now to know um, when a computer would become self-aware. I, I think the other thing that would make uh, AI besides that self-awareness, which is very difficult to measure at this point, that would make AI um, more human-like in its consciousness would be a self-organizing uh, system like the brain that is constantly changing. Um, it's physically changing in response to input and the environment. And I think until we have something like that, I, I don't know that we'll be getting very close to what we would consider to be consciousness. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting question, but a very difficult question. Which is probably why it still lives mostly in science fiction novels. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you, um, Amy and Laura, for your time and helping us um, you know, get some of these conversations going that we'll have over the next year. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks.